from Mark Tolliker from Warwick University, uh, who speaks on campuses and their fun time approximation. Thank you very much. Let me begin by saying it's a pleasure to be here. And, uh, Thank you for the opportunity to give this uh, colloquium. And uh, let me explain that what I was planning to do was uh, to talk about the following uh, topics. So I'll talk about some specific cantor sets, not general cantor sets. Uh, they arise in a very specific way, and they have applications to two different problems. Uh, one is connected, connected to uh, the Lagrange and uh, Markov spectra. And there's another application which is connected to the so called Zaremba. It's an R, not an N. Zaremba conjecture, which I'm also trying to explain later on. The idea is that I want to say something about very specific kinds of uh, Cantor sets and say something which uh, has an application to, to these two things. And the thing I always forget to say in talks is that I have a co author. My co author shares the brain is uh, Oliver Jenkinson, who is uh, the University of London, Queen Mary. Okay. And also I wanted to express a philosophy about a colloquia. So whenever I go to a colloquia, I like to think I'm going to benefit from it in some way, and take away something, and have profit from it in some way. And I can't guarantee that the mathematics in this talk will be of great interest to you. Uh, so therefore, I usually bring chocolate. If anybody would like a piece of chocolate, <laughs> <laughs> this works very well with undergraduates. It keeps an entire hour. So if you could please take one circuit, then that's one of the responsibilities of the company. <laughs> um, so let me be a little more specific. Uh, so the cantor sets I'm going to talk about are rather easy cantor sets. And they're going to live in the real line, back to the unit interval. And I'll define them in the following way. I'll fix the natural number, which is greater than to be a 2, greater than or equal to 2. I need to have 1. And then what I want to do is to define these cantor sets. And so the way I'll define them is they're going to be denoted by z, and will depend on uh, this value n. And they're simply the numbers x in the unit interval, such that when you look at their continued fraction expansion, so an expansion of the form a1, a2, a3, etc., which simply means 1 over a1, 1 over a2, 1 over a3, add into the item. So uh, we look at these guys, well, normally you take the number in the room. Rational number in the unit interval, then it will have uh, some continued fraction expansion. Uh, but I want to impose the condition that these coefficients, the digits, are only going to be between 1 and n. So they're bounded digits. So that means that a1, a2, a3, etc., whatever they are, they're going to be either 1, 2, up to n. Not a very strong condition. And so what I'm describing here is the set of um, points with continued fractions, uh, continued fraction expansions with bounded digits. So continued fraction. fraction expansion. With, in this case, bounded by the value of n. And uh, there's some things you can prove very easily about uh, this set. So these are just easy properties. So easy properties use a euphemism for a card you have to prove them. But in principle, they're easy to prove. And the first one is that indeed E of n is going to be a cancel set sitting inside the unit interval. Uh, and secondly, um, it's not a very fat cancel set. In particular, it has the vague measure equal to zero. So somehow I've got some set uh, consisting of points in the unit interval, a cancel set of them denoted by E of n, and the way they're defined is a continued fraction expansion is 
just taking coefficients from 1 up to, to n. And so a question one can ask is the following. How big is this net? So it's a Cantor set. Some Cantor sets might be bigger than others in some appropriate sense. And so what's the right way to specify this? Um, and the right way is perhaps to use the notion of dimension. So, so if you have a Cantor set, there are lots of different ways that you can think about the dimension, lots of different definitions. There's very complicated definitions and there's very easy definitions. Uh, I'm going to vote for the easy definition. Good. And uh, it's the following. So let's recall our following. This is the definition of box dimension. So we want to associate some number to this cancel set, which is going to tell us how large it is as a cancel set. And the definition is uh, reassuringly short, so it's the dimension of the set E of n. And so what we do is the following. So we choose an epsilon greater than zero, which eventually is going to tend to zero. And then what we do is we look at the number of intervals. So this is the number of um, epsilon intervals, intervals of length epsilon, uh, needed to cover at my set E of n. So this is the minimum number of such guys. So the idea is, I can look around here very short. So here's my cancel set. This cancel set is a bit untypical in the sense that it only seems to have a finite number of points. It should be uncountable. But the idea is that you give me an epsilon and I try to cover it by a finite number of epsilon intervals, which would be possible. The rule of length epsilon. And the minimum number I need to do this is going to be denoted by n of epsilon. And then I can define the number, which is going to be the dimension of the set e to n. And it's simply the growth rate of n of epsilon as epsilon tends to zero. So growth rate means I should put logs in it. And so the definition I will take to be the following. It's the yin, maybe soup, as epsilon decreases to zero. Um, of the log of n of epsilon over the log of 1 over epsilon. In order that it's a positive number. And with some luck, the limit may not exist, but in this case it has a limit suit, uh, and it will give me some number between 0 and 1. And so this is supposed to tell me how large this Cantor set is in some kind of simple, quantifiable way. So if I voted for the, uh, the complicated definition, which is the household dimension, it actually turns out to be the same. It's the same number for these particular cancel sets. But uh, there's less grief if I give you the simple uh, definition. So let me just note that at the bottom. So note, so first of all, uh, the sets D of N, uh, this is the same value. It's a household dimension. It's a household, which is a more sophisticated and subtle notion of dimension, uh, but somewhat harder to write down the definition in a short space of time. And uh, secondly, um, it's a number. Well, what number is it? Well, if instead of looking at continued fractions, I, I talked about the middle for the Cantor set, then of course. Everybody knows that the household dimension of that, or the dimension of that, the box dimension is just log 2 over log 3. In this particular case, uh, there's no uh, explicit formula uh, for the value of the dimension of these sets. Uh, these cases. Okay, so there's no explicit formula. Saying just that you don't know one, or you can prove that there isn't any? Uh, there's no explicit formula known to me. Okay. And uh, there, there are smarter people who may know, but they haven't told me. So <laughs> I don't know. No explicit uh, first form formula for uh, the dimension of E of N. Uh, let me just put in brackets. Known to me. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. 
And so if we don't actually know what this number is, it's difficult to say much about it, but one can actually go about computing it. And so if you take a specific value of n, you can say, well, we have this Cantor set. What mm -hmm. value does it take between 0 and 1? So let me do an example. So this is an example. And I'll take the simplest case, which is n is equal to 2. So it defines a Cantor set for living in the interval. 0 and 1, hopefully. And then what we want to do is to compute the, well, this estimate the, the, um, the dimension, which will be a real number. And so one can do that. And so the first work I, I know of on this was due to uh, Jack Good uh, from 1941. He was a student of Besakovich and Hardy in Cambridge. And he went on to be part of the uh, Bletchley Codebreakers. And uh, if you have seen uh, the film The Imitation Game, uh, which is about the life of Turing, he's one of the characters in it. If you haven't seen it, then that will be nothing to you. So, we can estimate the Hausdorff dimension, or box dimension, of this set, this set E of 2. That is, all the guys whose continuing fraction expansion only contains the digits 1 and 2. And so, uh, Good actually computed it to two decimal places, and uh, as of two years ago, the best result was, uh, whoops, oh, digits are the wrong way around, uh, so it's 3, 1, 2, 8, uh, 0, 5. So this was proved by uh, Folk and Newsfile, and it was in 2016. It's the non-linearity of this continuing fraction expansion that makes it more difficult to, to actually compute. Uh, but Oliver Jenkinson and I computed some more decimal places, and we got that it's equal to uh, 062-77-205-14162-4486. Oops. Or 686. Uh, four, seven, Uh, 
No, they're, they're not. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about n equals 5 in a minute, just to show some diversity. Uh, in fact, they, they don't really quite continue fractions either. Um, if, if you're more dynamical, it, it's, it works for any limit set and iterator function scheme, basically. But by providing it's conformal. Stuff like that. Okay, and so, question that always occurs to me in talks uh, around about this period is the following. So if you can compute some number with some accuracy, uh, what's it good for? And so the first thing I want to talk about is the application to the first problem, which is to do with the, the spectra. And so in order to do that, I have to delve into some number theory. It's not a, a terrain that I normally visit, so be patient. But I will try to explain what I understand by the problem, and then explain why these calculations have some bearing on it. So, my numbering hasn't completely gone. This will be just the first application. application. One. And it's the application of that sort of stuff. And it's the, as I just indicated, Lagrange and Markov spectrum. What are they? They're just subsets of the positive real numbers defined in some appropriate way. And to motivate it, uh, let me just recall an elementary piece of mathematics. And the elementary piece of mathematics is the Dirichlet theorem in approximation of irrational numbers. So this is Dirichlet's theorem, which I believe is from 1840-ish. It wasn't around at the time. And if you have an irrational number, so for alpha irrational, it is an irrational number alpha, <clears throat> you can find infinitely many uh, rationals P over Q, maybe K prime as well, uh, satisfying the usual inequality, so such that alpha minus P over Q. That's going to equal to 1 over q squared. So Dirichlet, of course, is a very distinguished uh, analyst. He was also married to uh, Mendelssohn's uh, sister. So it's a musical connection. It's a very strong one, it's true. And so you can improve on this. So for individual alphas, you can improve on this. Improve this. What does improve means? It means that we can get a, a smaller upper bound. So in particular, we can hope to improve it to the following. Alpha minus P over Q is less than something smaller. Well, how about 1 over Q squared times C of alpha? The sum um, C of alpha is in the given So it's a slightly better version of, of the Richet's theorem for individual alphas. And the value of C of alpha in this case, you choose the best one you can, the largest you can for a given alpha, well, this, the, the, this will vary depending on your particular choice of alpha. And the set of values you get are the following. So we can define the first of these guys with the Grange spectrum. Spectrum singular. And how do we define it? Well, it's defined to be the collection of all these numbers. So what is it first? Let me denote it by L. It's going to be a subset of uh, the positive reals. In fact, it will be starting at 1. It's a bit bigger than that. And the way it's defined is by lumping all these guys together. So it's a set of C of alphas that you could get as you range over all the rational numbers. Easy enough. Okay, and uh, my notes I've written is each of these values is 1 over the lim in PQ tends to infinity of alpha minus P over Q times Q squared, which is meant to mean it's the best, the largest value you can get for an individual alpha, but I always get confused by reciprocals and lim soups, 
So I don't trust myself too much, but it's, it's correct. Okay, and so what does this uh, thing look like? Well, we know it's in the positive reals. Here's zero. Somewhere out there is infinity. We don't want to get there, hopefully. Um, and it's going to take some values. So one value is going to be the value which is the square root of 5. So if you take um, alpha to be equal to uh, the golden mean, which is 1 plus root 5 over 2, then there's a theorem of Horowitz that says that you can choose root 5 here, and that's one of the values in the spectrum. And similarly, for other uh, algebraic numbers, you can get other values, such as um, square root of, of, of 8, and um, square root of 2, 2, 1 over 5, and other wonderful numbers, uh, going up to some value which is uh, 3. I'm going to walk to the back of the room, because I'm suspecting that blue is almost invisible from different parts of the room. It's okay. It's okay, right. Thanks for that. I'm only yellow about myself, and so I might lapse into that. Okay, and so that's what happens up to three. So it's actually a countable set up to, up to the value of three. And these come from what we call Markov triples, so this is countable. <coughs> and at the other end, uh, there's another magic value somewhere up here, which is about 4. Point, uh, something, 4.5 something, 2 blah blah blah. And beyond that, it's actually going to be a lot of guys up there. It's going to be just a continuum, a half line. And then, so this is uh, what's called the Hall's ray, so it's just a half line. And somewhere in between, there's all sorts of stuff. It's kind of a mess. There's cantor sets and there's intervals and all sorts of stuff. So this is a mess. It's a technical term. Okay, so that's what it looks like. And there is a connection between uh, the Lagrange spectrum, which is obviously a problem in number theory, and uh, continued fractions. So let me just explain what that is. And it has a slightly more dynamical flavor. Not very dynamical, but slightly more dynamical. And it goes something like the following. And this definition dates from about 1930. So this is the connection to continuing fractions. So what we can do is the following. Uh, I'll take the natural numbers. And I'll look at all sequences indexed from minus infinity to plus infinity. So this is all sequences of natural numbers. And then what I can do then is I can also define a function on the space. So this takes me from my space of sequences of natural numbers into just the reals of fact. And the way it's defined is I take a sequence, which might be, I guess, A of N, and runs from much in the integers. And what it does is it has to associate a real number. And so what we can do with the digits which are bigger than 1, the indices bigger than 1, is to write down to the fraction. So that would be A1, A2, A3. So just the usual continued fraction expansion. Uh, associated to the, the guys whose indices are bigger than 1. And then we can also add to it a 0, which is just some natural number. And then we can also add to this the continued fraction where we go backwards in the other digit. So it gives me some function in the space of sequences. And then if you didn't like the first definition of the Lagrange spectrum, then the second definition is coming up. It's the same thing as the following. If I take the function f at some particular sequence a of n, so uh, this is going to be in my space of sequences, and I take its value, then by itself it's probably not very exciting, but if I shift the sequence by k places, and I take the uh, limb soup as k times to infinity, then the value that I get for that will be one of the elements of the Lagrange spectrum. So 
So I take an infinite sequence, I apply the function, I keep shifting it, I get lots of guys, and the limb sweep of these values is going to be a number in this, in this space. That's the plane. And it's closely related to the Markov spectrum, the other guy over here. And uh, in that case, it's the same thing, except you just take the suprema. So this is going to be the uh, suprema over k's of the values you get for this function by shifting the given sequence, and then you allow it to range over all sequences in this space. OK, so we have two different subsets of um, positive real numbers, one I've drawn. Uh, if I wanted to draw what the Markov spectrum looks like, it actually looks rather like that. It's almost identical. Uh, in fact, it has almost exactly the same uh, picture. So let me just make a comment on, on that, and then I'll try to explain why it's connected with the household dimension of this bizarre set. I was hoping at some stage that I could get uh, an even longer expansion for this value, but I could use the entire talk writing it on the board. That would avoid me having to prove anything in the end. Okay, and so there are alternative definitions of the, of the Markov spectrum in terms of quadratic form, which I'll skip. And let me just make the following comment. So the sets L and M, which are both subsets of the positive uh, reals, um, are similar. What does that mean? Are similar. It's better if I spell it correctly. Similar. Well, first of all, uh, L is contained inside M, so one of those is contained inside the other. And in fact, they're identical on certain regions. So L and M agree, well they agree on the region from 0 up to 3, so they agree on this countable bit down here, they have the same values in that region, and they also agree on this Hall's ray, which is not very exciting, it's just this entire line out here, so they agree on 4.5 something or other of the infinity. Um, and moreover, if you look at the difference of these two sets, so the set theory has a difference, so n minus l, then its Lebesgue the measure is equal to zero. So it's kind of a small set in some reasonable sense. And so uh, it is, however, the case that they're different. Despite these similarities, l is not equal to m. And this brings the question. Well, how big is the difference? So the question, um, how large is this difference? Going to get the right way around, I guess, of n minus n. That's the question. And of course, uh, by this, I mean how big is the dimension, because it's got zero uh, the vague measure. And um, the answer to that is that there's a, a bound using this set E2. And so, in particular, it's known that the following is true. So, this is a result of Mateus and Murera. And they showed uh, in 2018, whenever that was, uh, that uh, the set M minus L, this set which you want to show is not too small, uh, contains a Copy, use up the dysmorphism of one of these sets E2. That is, points is continuous fraction expansion only contains ones and twos. And because it has a copy, this in particular implies that uh, the house dimension and the box dimension, well, the box dimension and the house dimension, let me just say house dimension for the moment, is a stronger result uh, of the set um, n minus l, but it's going to be bigger than the dimension of the set m2, which we now know is 0 0.53 whatever, something. Um, and that gives us a lower bound on this side. And as far as I know, the best result at the moment for the upper bound 
is that uh, the house automation is less than 0 0.98 and stuff. So the connection between working out the house automation of these sets is that they have some relevance in distinguishing these sets in a number theory. So if you're not very keen on Lagrange and the Markov spectrum, the good news is that was it. And what I'll do now is, is to explain um, the same sort of application of, of dimension of, of Cantor sets, but to the Zaramba conjecture. Well, not the conjecture itself, but some results relating to it. So let me just write that out. And so, in order to get there, I need the household dimension, dimension of some set, box dimension of some set. And so I'll take a second example. And in this case, I'll take n to be equal to 5. So now I'm looking at the Cantor set of points in the unit interval whose continued fraction expansion only contains the digits 1, 2, 3, or 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And what we estimate the following. Estimate. So the estimates in this case are not quite so good for reasons that I'll explain later if I have time. So the dimension of this particular Cantor set uh, is equal to uh, 0. Point 8, 3, 6, uh, 8, 2, 9, 4, 4, plus or minus 10 to the minus 8, which again means that the dimension is specifically in this interval of size 2 times 10 to the minus 8. And so this is a result which we computed. So this is So it's another estimate on the size of a cantor set in this particular case. And so I wrote down here before the question, yes. again. So an application of this is going to be to a question to do with a so-called Zorando conjecture. The bad news is I now have to try to state the Zorando conjecture kind of accurately. And I think in order to do that, maybe I'm going to move back here. So this is going to be an application by estimates. So this is application two. And what is it? So uh, let me begin by... So Zaramba was a, a Polish mathematician who uh, actually died in Britain, in Aberystwyth, in Wales. He worked at the University of Wales. And his conjecture was to do with a Dijkantai approximation as well, sort of. And so I'm going to recall another elementary result in, in uh, number theory. So if you take any rational number, P over Q, which happens to be in the unit interval, not the place to be, uh, then it can be written, written as a finite continued fraction. fraction. If you're allowed to use all of the natural numbers as digits. And the conjecture of Zaramba. basically says that uh, if you take, uh, if you're only interested in the denominators, you don't care about the numerators, then you should be able to get all the denominators if you allow finite continued fractions which only have digits from 1 up to 5. And let me try to write that in some coherent way. So if you take any uh, denominator, then you can find a numerator, it's going to be new into the fact. And you can find uh, coefficients a1 up to an, the length could be very large, in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And let me call this set a, which I'll refer to it again soon, um, such that indeed p over q can be written as a finite continued fraction. So that would be a1. So this time up to A then, stopping there. So that's 
the usual notation, 1 over 1, plus 1 over 2, plus x to the 1 over a n. So the Zaramba conjecture says you should be able to get all the denominators if you only use the digits 1 to 5 in the expansion. And so uh, the bad news is that I think it's still open. Uh, it's now suddenly it's closed, so I think the conjecture is still open. And you might ask, why is it 5? Uh, well, the answer is, if, if you look at the digits 1, 2, 3, 4, it turns out to be false. You can find a counter example. So 5 is apparently the magic uh, number. So if the conjecture is open, what can we say? Well, there is a, um, a positive result uh, in the case uh, of the Zaramba conjecture, uh, where you look not at all q, but you look at a density 1 set. So, and this is a result due to uh, Organ and Horowitz. Uh, so let me just try to state that. And so there is a density one result. Uh, okay. well, what does this one say? It says the following, so this is a theorem. And it's uh, published in 2014, and it's a refinement uh, due to the student of Ontario, which is from 2015. And it says, not this same, but there's something a bit like it. It says that if you take the same set, A, this is 1, 2, then if we look at those values of q between 1 and some awfully big number m, m is going to be an awfully big number, such that this is true, that is, uh, we can find a corresponding numerator, and we can find the next digits uh, a1 up to a n in our set a, such that the corresponding rational can be written in that way, it's a1 to a n, then the proportion when we divide by m, well we take the limit, this m tends to m tends to infinity, and then this thing is equal to 1. So density 1 is all means that we don't know it's true for all q, but if we look at more and more q, it's more likely to be true, up to probability to 1. So this is a, a, nice, a nice result in a very with a very tough proof. And let me just make some comments on this and also explain the connection with what I was saying about the dimension of these cancel sets. So first of all, uh, the statement I've written is not the statement of Borgan and Kontorovich. They prove it for different sets, so Borgan and Kontorovich which uh, show the result. With the case where they took the set A to be equal to 1 and 2 up to 50. And what bigger set of values? Uh, in the previous preprint, they went up to, I think, 2000, but this was what they did in that case. And the students of Komporovic, or Wang, improved it to the value of n. So to find, improve this to the set A. The one is stated. Fine. So the statement here is the one that appears in this, this paper. And it appears almost like this, but there is a hypothesis. And the hypothesis to give the statement is that the uh, dimension of the set E5, that is, the points in the Cantor set, is continuing fraction of Spanish and it contains digits 1 to 5, uh, has to be bigger than uh, 5 over 6, which I believe might be equal to 0 0.8333 recurrent, something like that. So in his proof, it requires this, uh, this uh, inequality. And fortunately for him, or possibly unfortunately, uh, he cites uh, a previous estimate on this. And 
So he proves this result, he requires this hypothesis, and then he cites a paper of Jenkinson. So, what's your meditation is it? So, uh, this is 2015. Uh, cites a paper of Jenkinson, my co author, from uh, 2004 where it says that uh, the dimension of uh, E5 is equal to uh, 0.8368. It's fortuitously it's slightly bigger than this uh, value here. But of course, back in 2004, the world was a simpler place, and um, Jenkinson didn't bother about error terms. Uh, so in fact, in this particular notation, uh, the error might be the same as the actual number. So it's not overly useful as a particular reference. So this is a, uh, this is a heuristic estimate. But uh, fortunately, it's now a little Yeah, well, they, they also need the, the household dimension of these sorts of sets. Uh, so in general, because if you take 5 to be 50, then this capital set's kind of big. And it's very easy to show that this household dimension is close to 1. So in, in, in this game, they just they, they weren't too worried about the actual uh, digit here. They just wanted to get the proof to work nicely. And so they just chose a value which gave them a fat enough capital set that they wouldn't have problems. And this capital set, it kind of occurs in the proof because they use the circle method. And when you do estimates on major rocks, it comes into these apparently. So I read. Um, these things. Let me just look at my watch. How are we doing? Excellent. So, so I'm looking at my notes. Cool. What's the pages we got? Um, so I could either uh, give another application or I could say something about the proof. Um, Maybe I will say something about the proof because writing down lots of digits of numbers has a limited appeal. Uh, so let me uh, just say. Before you get off this, could you just remind us what your estimate is? How, how close it is it to the uh, Well, the, the, this value is actually, this, this one, of course, is not so great. Uh, our estimate is the one over here. So in fact, it is correct to the four digits given, but it wasn't proved to be correct. So. Um, it's, it's now known to be, uh, we know it to uh, eight decimal places. Okay, so let me say something about the proof, just to give some variety to, to things a bit. Um, Can I ask a question? question? Yes, please. Is it related to sort of uh, this left shift of the continued fraction? Which yeah, we're back to uh, the my notes, yeah. So the Gauss map would, would make an appearance. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's fine. I, I like people like this way rather than say. Great. So let, let me, first cued in this way, prompted in this way, uh, let me uh, say something about the proof. Um, but I won't say very much, just in case you don't like uh, long technical proofs, it's not going to be very technical. Uh, so this is about estimating. Oh, three, section three didn't do here. So let's say estimating the dimension of the unit there. Yeah, so I, uh, as you probably realize by now, I'm not a number theorist. I'm not really an analyst. I do some sort of dynamical system stuff. So here it appears, and it's a very simple one. Uh, I want to define a transformation, T, from my cancel set to the set. And how am I going to define that? Well, I'm going to apply the Gauss map. Let me try to write it in a sort of German. It's more erudite. And so the transformation T of X is you take 1 over X, which of course may be outside the, the set, so we take the fractional part of that. So we take away the part. Fractional part. So this gives me a transformation for A given N on my particular set. And so what I want to do now is to somehow get a number out of it. And so what I do is I define a function for two variables. And so this function is defined in the following way. So the variables are going to be z and t, which I might think of as being real or complex. And how is it defined? Well, it's defined by taking 
of the uh, exponential minus the summation n equals 1 to infinity of z to the n over n. So there's a power series in here, that's where the z comes in. And then I sum up over all those periodic points, or fixed points for t to the n. So t to the n, of course, is just t composed of itself <coughs> three times. And I look at all the points fixed under this, and then I've got some number in here. And what I do is I put the derivative of my map, n times, I take the absolute value. Now the t, the other variable, appears as an exponent. And then I divide that by 1 minus 1 over t to the n prime x, like that. You might ask, why do I do that? And the short answer is because it works. Um, but it's a function now of two variables. That bracket should have been around there. I'm teaching dynamical systems in, in two weeks, or three weeks' time. So I hope you get back into practice in my handwriting. Or is this a modified zeta function? Or is this not standard function? It's a sort of zeta function. So, so the, the paternity of zeta function guys, um, they like to play around with the definitions of it. So it's actually, it's more like a sort of a determinant of some operator. Um, but whatever it is, it's just a guide for the moment. And the relevance of this is that, first of all, it's analytic. It has an analytic extension. It converges somewhere and has an analytic extension to c squared. So it makes sense for all values of z and t. And the connection with the dimension is if I set z equal to 1, having introduced it and I'll get rid of it again, um, then the solution to z is 1 and the value of t being the dimension of e of n is equal to 0. What does that mean? It means that if I plot as a function of t uh, my function d1 of t, so I take z equal to 1, uh, then I get some plot that maybe looks like that. It's meant to be uh, 1 t goes to d z equal to 1 t. Um, and it crosses the axis here um, at the value the dimension of so if I want to know the dimension, all I have to do is to find a zero for this particular uh, object. So this seems... Does capital N appear in some place in the function? Uh, no, N, N, N was fixed at the beginning. Oh, um, in the very beginning. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we fix N according to which problem we want to solve. Okay. And that gives That's us a set, and then that particular set is a zero. Of course, it's the same transformation, but uh, it's applied to different, different sets. Uh, so if I was a... Uh, so that's for the periodic point. So, so the x's have to be an en. That's correct. So the transformation is, I, I defined it on the set. So indeed, all of these guys are in en. So in fact, all they are, in fact, is simply our quadratic surds. So they're things whose continued fraction expansion is periodic. So they're out of great numbers. Um, and uh, the coefficients in the expansion are just 1 up to n again. So let me just uh, finish off by finishing the arguments. So let me just mention that this is essentially uh, an argument due to, I uh, think this, this characterization is essentially due to uh, Rufus Bowen, which was published in a posthumous paper. He died in 1978. I think the paper was 1979. And if we wanted to actually find out this value for a particular set E2 or E5 or something, then we know how to do it, sort of. Except, unfortunately, infinity is rather a big number, and there are lots of things you've got to compute. So in practice, you don't want to do that. So to, to actually uh, make any progress, what we do is use a z variable again, and we, ex we next expand this expression in z. And so I'll write d of z of t is equal to something. Well, I just expand it as a power series in z, it's a constant. So that's the sum n equals 1 to infinity a n of t. So the coefficients are going to depend on t, and, and it's a series in f. I'm just taking the power series of actually this funny function over here. And the computer still doesn't like infinite things, and so I have to truncate it. So therefore, I look at um, same thing, but I just consider part of the series, so that would be n 
equals uh, one of some big value f, so both big number, um, a n c z to the n plus whatever's left over, which I'll call e a of anything. So this is just the truncation. truncation. And this is just the error, whatever's left over. And so the game is that if you want to uh, find the if you want to find the value of the dimension, instead of working with this, this function, or sorry, this function, which is the same as this function, which is kind of hard to compute, we can try this one instead, and the hope is that it's going to be kind of close. And so when we look for zero for this guy, then it will give us some approximation to the value of this. And so let me just finish with a comment. So that's the strategy. And so the hard part is actually computing all of these values. So if we choose a large value of L, then of course we've got to compute all of these coefficients, and they depend on lots of quadratic thirds or periodic points. It's a whole bunch of numbers, and as L gets bigger, life gets worse. So the choice of this bound L is determined um, by the time needed to compute um, the values a1 of t up to a l of t, the coefficients of this approximation. And so for example, so for example, if you take uh, l to be equal to 11, then on my computer it's a week. to compute just the first 11 coefficients to give us the approximation, which gives us the approximation to the function which gives us the zero. So this will be our approximation here. Uh, and this is in the case that n is equal to 5. If you take uh, L to be equal to 14, and it grows exponentially, uh, it will take a year. And if you took L to be equal to 30, it would take uh, 13 billion years, which I suspect is a lifetime as a universe according to, to Wikipedia. So if you want to get these estimates, what happens is you choose L as big as you can, and usually running your computer for a week seems enough, and then you're left with this uh, error term. So you're left to And that's what gives you the degree of approximation uh, in these uh, approximations. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? Is there any statement that might, because it's 100 digits useful for the degree, for the dimension? In Is it useful? Um, not, to, not perhaps to, to most people. Uh, if you get very long digits, then the temptation is always to try and find out if the number has some particular properties. Is it algebraic or something like that? Uh, but some things I have not, not yet yielded any information. So I think the short answer is no, it's not particularly useful to compute things of that sort of accuracy. But it's an artifact of the method that it, it's more efficient in some things. So the easy things like E2, you can use it to lots of decimal places. And for harder problems, it doesn't look significantly harder, but it is significantly harder to compute E5. Well, you run it, and it still gives you a reasonably good estimate at eight decimal places, more than you get by some other methods. Not all of them. Is there any statement about, so related, to, in the spirit of the number conjecture, which comes from this estimates for dimension of E2? Uh, no, I think, and not that I know of. Let me just say that. So what do the continued fraction approximates for this for these dimensions look like? I mean, can you say anything about about them? I mean, can you say for certain that it's like, say, the dimension for E2 is outside of E2? Um, I, I don't know much about it. So uh, I, I can tell you the following, which is that the reason that it re works reasonably well is because these coefficients go down very fast. So, I mean, 
in order for this error to be small, you need that what's left is going to be small. And so what typically happens uh, E of n um, is all the e to the minus uh, n squared times a constant, so constant n squared. So they go down faster than exponential, not like c times n, the exponent of c times x squared. So therefore, the numbers that we're looking at, you know, they're, they're given by things which approximate and they function, uh, approximate to polynomials very quickly. But the difficulty is that the t, the value we're looking at, is embedded in here when we get to the zero. So the short answer is a lot of random answer. Uh, the short answer is I can't say anything specific, but I'm sure that something could be said. You know what I mean? So you mentioned some other applications? Yeah, so, um, okay, so, so there's two answers to that question. So the first is I didn't do pages uh, five and six in my notes, which was another sort of household dimension limit set kind of thing. So, um, so another application was to something called the Hensley injection. which I will not elaborate on, but it's a variant on the Zarambic conjecture. The only thing is that it's actually false, so you can construct a counterexample using this method. And the other thing is that, well, if you're not a, a dimension theory kind of guy, um, you might ask, well, what else could you compute? And so, for example, you can use the same method to compute things like the Apollon exponents for random matrix products, if the matrices happen to be positive, or you can compute dynamical things like uh, entropy and metric entropy and stuff like that in certain cases. So it's kind of it's kind of versatile within its rather limited scale. Hello. So what you led to this uh, this work by the applications, or did you have something else in mind originally? Um, I uh, well, I, I was not motivated by the applications. I'm delighted to discover there were applications. Because uh, it helps uh, embellish the talk a bit. Um, I, I was actually brought into this because my background is more in terms of dynamical systems and zeta functions, dynamical zeta functions, not the number theory guys. And so I was kind of familiar with this technique, studying these things, and I had appreciated that these terms went down very fast, and so I kind of seemed logical that you could use it for these purposes. So I came at it from knowing a bit about the proofs. And then, then thinking that there might be interesting applications of it, which is lucky. Well, if there are no other questions, so let's thank the speaker again.